This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. I think we'd better get started in the interest of time. So I'd like to welcome you all to the monthly meeting of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. We are a not-for-profit volunteer organization founded in 1990 for the purpose of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian education. We are one of the largest vegetarian societies in North America with over 2,000 members. How many here tonight are not members? Oh, that's wonderful because we have membership applications. (laughs) We call them our green flyers and they're in the back on that table where Patrick is sitting. And with your membership, you receive a quarterly newsletter filled with educational and informative and uh, entertaining articles. Also, your membership card serves as a discount card at various merchants around town. So that, that benefit alone can more than cover the cost of your membership. And of course, by being a member, you'll be helping to support events like tonight's and helping to promote a healthful and compassionate lifestyle throughout our islands. So we encourage you to become a member tonight. You can fill out the form. We're delighted to welcome back to Hawaii Dr. Michael Greger. Dr. Greger is Director of Public Public Health and Animal Agriculture at the Humane Society of the United States. An internationally recognized lecturer, he has presented at the Conference on World Affairs, the National Institutes of Health, and the Bird Flu Summit as well as uh, countless other symposia and institutions. He was invited as an expert witness in defense of Oprah Winfrey at the infamous meat defamation trial. He's a graduate of the Cornell University School of Agriculture and the Tufts University School of Medicine. Please welcome Dr. Michael Greger. According to the American Dietetic Association, the largest association of nutrition professionals in the world, there's evidence that that vegetarians have lower rates of several of the chronic degenerative diseases that plague the Western world, like obesity. Vegetarians have less obesity, less heart disease, less high blood pressure, less diabetes, less cancer, and not just the big killers. Vegetarians also have less arthritis, too. Less kidney disease, less gallstones, hemorrhoids, constipation, diverticulitis, even appendicitis. The list goes on and on. But how much of these diseases can be attributed to meat? Well, according to estimates published in the prestigious peer-reviewed medical journal Preventive Medicine, they tried to estimate the health care costs associated with meat eating in the United States with meat consumption and up to two-thirds of the high blood pressure in this country is associated with is because of meat consumption about a quarter of the heart attacks in this country because of meat eating maybe forty percent of the cancer because of meat alone a third of the diabetes, up to three-fourths of all gallbladder operations caused by meat, and most of the food poisoning, of course, and half of the obesity in this country, meat. Those who eat meat are twice as likely to be hospitalized in any given year, twice as likely to be on medications, to require medications, and more likely to require emergency diagnostics and more likely to require emergency surgery than 
vegetarians. That's why I'm a vegetarian physician. And as such, of course, I'm more interested in the human cost, but they actually did kind of add up the um, health care cost of meat, and it turns out that it approached $60 billion, which is really kind of comparable to the health care costs associated with tobacco. Um, and so maybe one day states will have, in addition to billions of dollars of uh, tobacco settlement, settlement money, billions of public health dollars from the meat industry as well. Dr. Mary Nessel is one of the most respected nutrition experts really in the world. She was the director of nutrition policy at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, longtime nutrition chair at NYU, had this to say. She said, the evidence is so strong and overwhelming and produced over such a long period of time that it really is no longer debatable. There is no question that a largely vegetarian diets are quite simply as healthy as one can get. So whether you're trying to align your life with your values of justice and compassion or just trying to eat healthier, Vegetarianism is a great gift one can give oneself, one's family. Literally millions of Americans have already made the transition. And the only way you're going to know whether it's right for you is to give it a try. Just like it's never too late to stop smoking, never too late to start exercising, never too late to start eating healthier. Isn't it hard to eat vegetarian though no open heart surgery let me tell you that's hard eating spaghetti is easy certainly comparably but seriously any habit is hard to change it takes about three weeks to change any habit so i recommend trying vegetarian eating uh, like a free sample try it for a month and see how you feel right? If you do a white, you can see, right, you can see your weight go down, your blood sugar and cholesterol um, get better, blood pressure go down. And this talk is all about doing it right. Of course, health is not the only reason people go vegetarian. They also do it for the health of the animals, health of the planet. And, you know, that's what I like about plant-based diets. Everything, arguably, the most ethical diet also happens to be the most nutritious diet environmentally sound diet also so happens to be the healthiest isn't that convenient it comes to a point where we'll say well, wait a second why not vegetarian and indeed if you're motivated you can find countless resources as to the whys to go vegetarian the best print resource is I believe this pamphlet called Try Vegetarian I don't know if we have any of those here but you can find it we do wonderful and we can also you can also find it at tryvegetarian.org where you can get it at the table in the back um, the best film resource is a documentary called Peaceable Kingdom. Has it been shown here? It has. Wonderful. Hopefully it'll happen again. Uh, and uh, the best online resources, there's a number of them. There's goveg.com, tryveg.com, chooseveg.com, choosevegetarian.com. For those with no access to the internet, there are a number of vegetarian starter kits, which you can order over the phone for free. This one you can get by dialing 866-MEAT-FREE, and the other one by dialing 888-VEG-FOOD. So there's a lot of good resources that, out there as to why to choose to eat vegetarian, but you know, there's less out there about kind of how to go vegetarian. That's what I'd like to spend most of the time today, just kind of the practical tips on making the transition. And to make this talk as inclusive and comprehensive as, as possible, I'm going to actually talk about how to transition to eating vegan. Uh, vegetarians don't eat animals. Vegans don't eat animals or animal products, such as meat or dairy, for many of the same reasons that people go vegetarian, health, animal welfare, and... Um, and certainly environmental concerns, unfortunately, also apply just as well as to these other products. 
Um, and to learn more, you can check out the uh, factory farming pages of the Humane Society of the United States for um, hens and for cows. And, of course, the flip side of the dairy industry, which is really veal. That's where all the male calves go. Obviously, so, though, this talk is appropriate for just those who are trying to cut out the flesh foods from their diet. Okay, well, how do you do it? Well, some people do just kind of go cold tofu, you know, usually because of some kind of sudden event in their life, like a heart attack or like Lisa Simpson, who just started thinking about where food came from and decided right there. But you know, most people, the studies show that most people transition towards vegetarianism and the importance of kind of going at one's own pace. Like anything in life, kind of chopping something up into smaller bits is just to handle, not so overwhelming that way. Right? Well, so how do people transition? Well, the traditional way is for people to start with SAD, the standard American diet, and then cut out, try dropping red meat and then give up chicken and uh, then seafood down to eggs, etc. But you know, whether you're doing it for your health or for the animals, the environment, these foods really aren't much better. And so instead of cutting out categories of meat, many have found the so-called three-dinner method more useful. How this method works is you try by making three, you start out by making three meatless dinners a week, and then uh, this gives you a chance to try new foods, start experimenting um, uh, with, uh, with vegetarian meals cuisine. So instead of having feeling like you're taking away from your diet, you really adding variety to your diet. And then, when you're comfortable with that, you can make more veggie suppers and move on to lunch and breakfast as well. So that's one method. But my favorite method is the method that I think makes most sense. This is the one suggested by the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, detailed here in their vegetarian starter kit, called the three-step method. It's based on research that shows that a typical American family only eats eight or nine different dinners, which they just kind of rotate through throughout the year. And so the question says, okay, well, where can I find you know, nine eight or nine vegetarian meals that I enjoy and can prepare easily? The three-step method. So step one is you sit down and you list all the dinners that you currently eat, so many people are surprised to find out how much they already eat that's vegetarian. Whether it is you know, spaghetti with marinara sauce, a vegetable stir fry, pasta primavera, that kind of thing. There are also a lot of prepackaged convenient foods that many are surprised to find out that are vegan, all the, uh, totally vegetarian. Here's just a, um, uh, a uh, kind of a montage of some of them. And so the first step is to think of three plant-based foods that you already enjoy, and then um, uh, three down, six to go. Step two is trying to think of three meals that you already prepare regularly that can be easily kind of adapted to a vegetarian menu. So eat beef burritos, well, one can just as easily eat bean burritos, instead can substituting these canned vegetarian refried beans, um, which is, you know, cheaper, healthier, um, uh, you know, use chicken broth. Well, how about no chicken broth? You can get uh, some of these um, uh, products at Down to Earth and other local stores. Or there's just vegetable broth as well. Again, Convenience, these are aseptic packages, so you can just keep it on the shelf. Don't even have to refrigerate these products, and they're there when you need it. You know, a lot of soups, stews, casseroles can be easily vegetarianized, veganized, with a few simple changes. And finally, my favorite step, step number three, and that is exploring new veggie options. Your diet should be a celebration. There are literally hundreds of vegetarian cookbooks out there. In fact, Amazon counts, uh, how many are there? Th over 3,000, I believe. It's on here somewhere. Um, uh, there we go. I'm sorry, 19,342 um, uh, vegetarian cookbooks out there. 
Um, if you do actually want to buy one, my favorite cookbook of all time is this one called The Compassionate Cook because it's very simple, not, no weird ingredients and everything I've tried in it is really quite delicious. But no need to spend a penny. You go to your local public library and there are not just vegetarian cookbooks but entire shelves of vegetarian cookbooks. So this is at um, the Hawaii Public Library, 483 titles. A thousand vegetarian recipes, and if that's not enough, there's a thousand and one vegetarian recipes to down the list. Interestingly, most vegetarians actually report more variety in their diet than they ever had as a meat eater. They feel like they have more choices, eating kind of a, you know, more interesting foods than they ever had on a non-vegetarian diet. So I encourage people to grab some cookbooks, start experimenting with new foods until you can find three that you enjoy and prepare easily. And then there you go, just like that, with minimum changes, there's your nine meals, vegetarian dinners, and you're off. And after that, coming up with vegetarian choices for lunch and breakfast are easy, especially with this myriad of plant-based meats and milks out there. For breakfast, there's everything from kind of vegetarian Canadian bacon um, and sausages, non-dairy cream cheese for your bagel, motherless milks for your cereal. How many people have tried the kind of vegetarian Canadian bacon stuff made by a company called Yves? Any report? What do you think? Good, bad? It's yummy. It's yummy. Anything else? All right, we got a thumbs up over there. All right, it's worth a try. Here it is compared to Babe. So we're talking about the same serving size here, but as you can see, Babe has four times more uh, calories, um, about... 40 times more saturated fat, infinitely more cholesterol, and yet, interestingly, just a quarter of the protein. So for your health and his best to stick to the veggie version if you haven't tried it already. At lunch, there are a lot of soups and salads, sandwich options, certainly. There's a whole array of veggie lunch meats now, everything from veggie ham, veggie turkey, veggie bologna, veggie salami, veggie pastrami, veggie hickory smoked turkey, veggie Philadelphia cheesesteak flavored turkey, on and on. There's even a vegetarian tuna for those tuna salad sandwiches called tuno, and if you actually look at the back, it actually says dolphin and tuna friendly. It's kind of nice. And safe for women and children, too, as there is no mercury or any environmental contaminants in it as well. For supper, there's, you know, veggie ground beef for your tacos, veggie chicken nuggets, wings, and of course, hot dogs, you know, veggie dogs, veggie burgers. Basically, how many of us kind of ate before, but uh, substituting these plant-based milks or meats um, for the foods that are made out of animals. There are a dozen substitutes for eggs, yogurt, cheese. There are a dozen substitutes for cow's milk, hamburgers, hot dogs. Let's look at hot dogs. All right, same serving size, but uh, Bessie over here has um, about five times uh, more calories, uh, about 150 times more fat, not to mention infinitely more saturated fat and cholesterol. There are a dozen substitutes for cold cuts, as we saw, ground beef, chicken nuggets. Anyone tried these, uh, these uh, meatless chicken nuggets? Anybody? Uh, what do you think? Even got like the fake gristle on everything. Yeah, there's something. I know, I know. All right. So instead of eating theirs, um, uh, there's not two, but three brands of vegetarian wings on the market now. And not one, but two brands of vegetarian ribs. All right. And for those of you who've just always wanted to eat vegetarian but couldn't give up the giblets, yes, indeed. <sighs> Tofurky giblet gravy. Fake, they even like little, I don't even know what giblets are, but these fake little squishy tofu things, I don't know, but uh, you can get anything these days. 
It is now easier than ever before to eat healthy, to eat vegetarian, especially with all these big natural food stores around the stock of ready um, range of vegetarian items. In terms of eating out, you know, any good, there, there are a number of uh, vegetarian friendly restaurants. I think I've eaten at all of them in the last few days. Um, uh, in the area, some of which are quite good, and a lot of vegetarian friendly restaurants. In fact, um, but you know, any, typically many of the kind of ethnic cuisines, whether it be Chinese, Mexican, or um, you know, a Middle Eastern European, Thai, Vietnamese, etc., have a wide variety of vegetarian topics. And if you go, here's the Oahu Dining Guide at the, at the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii website, and um, if I remember, I think there's like 77 listings just here on the island. So now if you notice, oh and here's the some things at some of these restaurants. Now if you notice, you know, I never even got to get to step number three, my favorite step, you know, new unexplored veggie dishes. You know, why have spaghetti with kind of fake meat sauce when you can, you know, flavor your pasta dishes with fresh oregano and garlic and sun-dried tomatoes, etc., etc. Now, true, I mean, from kind of an animal suffering point of view, everything I've showed you is completely fine. Um, from a health standpoint, yes, indeed, zero cholesterol in all plant foods. Cholesterol is made by the liver. Plants don't have little livers, so there's zero cholesterol in all plant foods. So healthier, much less saturated fat in general, certainly. For animals' health, people might not want to eat anything with a face, but for your coronary heart, best not to eat anything that ever had a liver. Cholesterol-free actually essentially means, means cruelty-free as well if you want to look at packaging. Um, but there are cheaper, there are healthier ways to eat with not all of this kind of wasteful packaging. I mean, look at this, as I showed you. You know, chips, cocoa pebbles, all sorts of things. Yeah, vegetarian but not necessarily healthy, right? Even this, this is even vegan, even says all vegetable, but it's probably the single unhealthiest thing you could possibly put in your body. Absolutely, I mean, worse than margarine, worse than butter, worse than lard, worse than spam, worse than all sorts of things. And on the back of this can, actually, it says, not intended to be used as a spread on foods like toaster crackers. Look at the Crisco when you see it. Nasty. All right. And then this is because of the hydrogenated fats. You know, the, but the number one re reason people go vegetarian in this country is for their health. In fact, more than for all reasons combined. And so I would like to spend, uh, spend some time on healthy eating. If you want a healthy body, we have to eat healthy food. You are what you eat literally, physically. Right? And so if you're interested in eating healthy, you have to eat your vegetables. Who can tell me where the single healthiest thing on the planet is? Anybody? Crisco's the worst, but what's the best? Watermelon. Watermelon is good, but there's something even better. Goji berries. In fact, all berries are good, but there's something even healthier than berries. Leafy green. Dark green leafy vegetables indeed, but who can name all ten? Anybody? All right, let's do this as a group project here. What's over here? Bok choy, very good. What about here? Oh, I'm sorry. This is uh, um, well. These are this is red stems. What do you think? Chard. chard. Actually, very good. Chard. Swiss chard. What about this? Collard greens. Very nice. This spinach. Wow. I can't even see it that well. Very good. Okay, down here also called rocket lettuce. Arugula, very nice. Okay, in here, my favorite dark green leafy. I'm sorry for the, it's a little bright in here. Kale, oh, you're so good. All right. Um, and then what about here? Okay, these are all red stems. These were some red, some yellow. Red stems. You had it before, didn't you? Beets, absolutely. Beet greens. In fact, Swiss chard is just kind of a fancy, uh, fancy beet. And then, okay, finally, what do we have? the two, oh, I don't even know what's next. We have some spicy ones here. Anybody? 
Mustard greens, indeed. Here, oh, here we go. Turnip greens, yes, like this, but without the red stems. And then finally, mustard greens and watercress. Greens, greens, greens. I recommend all my patients eat dark green leafies every single day of their lives until they die. Why do vegetarians have lower blood pressure, lower cholesterol, better blood sugar, and weight control? Well, you know, the health benefits are not just because you're staying away from all the bad stuff in meat, like saturated fat and cholesterol and, you know, uh, hormones, antibiotics, mad cow, all that stuff. But because of the good stuff in plant food. It's been estimated that if everyone just ate five darn servings of fruits and vegetables every day, there'd be 30% fewer strokes in this country, 20% less cancer, 15% less heart disease. We're not talking about cutting out meat, just eating five servings of fruits and vegetables every day. Imagine if there was a pill that could cut your stroke risk in half, cut your breast cancer risk in half, and only had good side effects. Everyone would be taking it. Some drug company making billions of dollars off it, right? But when that pill is eat about eight servings of fruits and vegetables, they cut your stroke risk in half, cut your breast cancer risk in half. People are like, yeah, 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 right? Plants are storehouses of thousands of these so-called phytonutrients, these special plant nutrients, right? So what is it in plant foods that's so good for you? Is it the vitamin C, the vitamin E, the fiber, the folate, the flavonoids, the phytoestrogens, the lycopene, the lutein, potassium? Who knows? And who cares? Well, the drug companies care, right? They can't patent a carrot, make a million dollars off it, though they're trying, certainly. Um, In fact, drug companies said, well, look, we know fruits and vegetables uh, um, can prevent cancer. And so, you know, I bet it's that beta-carotene stuff, that wonderful uh, plant pigment that makes fruits and vegetables yellow and orange. So they gave thousands of people beta-carotene pills to see if it would prevent cancer. Didn't work. In fact, those that took beta-carotene pills actually had more cancer than those that just took the sugar pills. There are over 500 different carotenes, carotenoids, from alpha carotene through zeta carotene and beyond, they just gave people beta and expected it to do something, right? So they tried vitamin E supplements, didn't work. In fact, higher total mortality in those that took 400 international units of vitamin E a day. We should rethink whether we want to take vitamin E supplements. All right, so vitamin E didn't work. In fact, those who took vitamin E supplements had shorter lives. Um, So they tried vitamin C supplements, didn't work. They tried combos of vitamin C, vitamin E, still didn't work. They just can't find the right mixture. Centrum, for example, just added lutein to their daily multivitamin. Lutein is this wonderful phytonutrient that's found in dark green leafy vegetables. If you look at the back here, it says each pill of lutein has 250 micrograms of lutein. Well, this single leaf of collard greens has over 10,000. So you can see what kind of just a marketing gimmick it all is. Eat your greens. So while drug companies have been somehow trying to cram this all into a pill somehow, we've known all along that fruits and vegetables work to prevent cancer, heart disease, stroke, all the chronic diseases that are wiping out uh, those of us in the Western world. So we know whole fruits and vegetables work. Why don't doctors prescribe them? Doctors should be whipping out, this should be everyone's multivitamin, doctors should be whipping out their prescription pads, writing broccoli, right? One cup a day, unlimited refills. Right? Right? Now, of course, if we actually did do that, we'd have to tell them the warn patients about the side effects of such a regimen. Side effects include... Uh, lower incidence of mouth cancer, of throat cancer, of lung cancer, esophageal cancer, gastric cancer, less cervical cancer, kidney cancer, ovarian cancer, um, prostate cancer, cervical cancer as well. That's what you'd have to deal with if you actually took this medication. Oh, that, and you might get a little piece of green stuck in your teeth, all embarrassing and everything. But that's it. Right? The same diet 
that prevents stroke and cancer also prevents heart disease and diverticulosis and protects against emphysema and dementia and macular degeneration eating just one and a half servings of fruits and vegetables every day and you cut your risk of getting cataracts fivefold that's how amazingly powerful these um, foods are wait a second but less heart disease cancer stroke aren't those the top three killers in the US yes indeed and you get all that wrapped up into one when you eat your greens in fact your veggies as well um, so the World Health Organization has blamed literally millions of deaths every year on inadequate fruit and vegetable consumption right? so we should eat our fruits and vegetables as if our lives depended on it because guess what it does so try to pour veggies on everything the more vegetables the better no longer should anyone in this room ever have pasta with marinara sauce they should have pasta with marinara sauce with lots of vegetables dumped on top never again a bean burrito but a bean burrito with lots of vegetables stuffed inside as many as we can possibly stuff in our face What's the recommended, anyone know what the recommended minimum number of daily servings of fruits and vegetables recommended by the federal government? Anybody? Five a day. Five a day, of course, right? Well, the official recommendation was just bumped. Now, nine a day. Nine servings. It's thought you weren't doing so good before. Now we're really behind, right? Well, wait a second. Why haven't many of us heard about this change from five a day to nine a day? Well, don't expect to hear about it anytime soon. The federal government spends about $10 million every year educating Americans about healthy eating. That's how much McDonald's spends every 48 hours on advertising. That's less than what a single candy corporation spends advertising a single brand of chewing gum every year. Right? You'll never see an ad on TV for this, one of the healthiest things on the planet, just because there's no profit margin. You can't make enough money to actually advertise off of it. You'll just see ads for junk. In fact, expensive junk. This is about 99 cents a pound. Uh, you compare that to potato chips or candy bars. But at least, I mean, why hasn't... Fine, you can realize we're not going to see it on TV. No one's going to make any money. But why hasn't your doctor at least been telling you this? Because odds are your doctor never learned any of this. Out of thousands of hours of preclinical pre instruction, your doctor, on average, probably got four hours of nutrition training. As of right now, less than a quarter of all medical schools in the country have a single course on nutrition. Right? In fact, there was this wonderful study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. This head-to-head -head test of nutrition knowledge, basic nutrition knowledge, doctors versus patients. Guess who won? Patients. People off the street know more nutrition than their doctors, yet people continue to go to their doctors for advice on healthy eating habits, and what their doctor is telling them is killing them. It was not too long ago that doctors were telling pregnant women to smoke cigarettes to deal with morning sickness. Until your doctor learns more about nutrition, they're advising you about your diet is physician-assisted suicide. There's one doctor, though, everybody trusts. Perhaps the most famous doctor of all time, Dr. Benjamin Spock, always on the forefront of uh, every important social issue. In the final edition of his book, the best-selling book in American history, second only to the Bible, he recommended that all children be raised vegan, with no exposure to meat or dairy, to prevent cancer, heart disease, all the chronic degenerative diseases that he was seeing all his patients' grandparents die from. So, more fruits and vegetables. People also don't even eat enough beans. What's so great about beans? Legumes, beans, peas, or lentils? Well, those, a recent study found that those that ate four servings of, of beans every week ended up with 20% less heart disease, the number one killer for both men and women over the last 70 years, right? 
Beans, beans, they're good for your heart. The more you eat, the more... Okay. <laughs> People don't eat enough nuts and seeds either. This is risk of heart attack. This is risk of heart attack versus nut consumption. These are people that don't eat nuts. These are people that eat nuts um, uh, one to four times a week. And these are about every day. So five times a week. As you can see, this is one half. This is half as big as this bar here. So you ha take your heart disease risk, cut it in half. You eat nuts every day. You cut your risk of a, of a heart attack and a fatal heart disease in half. Literally, you cut your risk in half. You eat nuts every day. In fact, Walter Willett, the chair of uh, Harvard's nutrition school, said in the 90s, the number one, if he had to pick one story of nutrition in the 1990s, it was that nuts were so incredibly healthy. We had no idea. But cutting the number one killer in the United States, the risk in half, just eating a handful of nuts every day. Right? Now, some people avoid nuts because they think they are fattening, but there's actually an impressive body of research that suggests that people who eat nuts every day may actually decrease um, body weight. And we're not sure why, because they are very calorie-dense, they are very fat-dense, it's good fat, but still, um, we're not sure if people are excreting more fat in their feces or it sufficiently lowers, um, it has an appetite suppressant in it or something, but who knows, who cares, won't make you fat, eat nuts every day as well. Now, are there some, so we have to just plow in the fruits and vegetables. Are there, are there some fruits and vegetables that are better than others? Um, yes, indeed, the best fruits are the berries. The healthiest fruits on the planet are the berries. Also healthy are the citrus fruits and the deep yellow and orange fruits and vegetables um, uh, like mangoes and papayas, apricots, cantaloupe, etc. These are actually the top five. This was a study done at Tufts University, my alma mater, um, which is, these were, they looked at 40 common fruits and vegetables and the top five out of all these fruits and vegetables, dozens, they looked at top five in terms of antioxidant content, where antioxidants are these anti-aging, anti-cancer phytonutrients. Um, and indeed, four out of the top five were berries, certainly the healthiest foods. Now, the next vegetables, ooh, this was actually number one. Anyone guess? Number one, what won the heavyweight title for antioxidant champion of the year? I heard it over here. Indeed, number one, kale. Spinach, Brussels sprouts, alfalfa sprouts, and broccoli. So notice, what are the healthiest vegetables on the planet? Dark, green, leafy vegetables. Right? Particularly these cruciferous vegetables, the cabbage family vegetables like kale, Brussels sprouts, alfalfa sprouts, and broccoli. They seem to have these, um, I have a whole talk on cancer prevention. They have these, these phytonutrients called glucosinolates that actually boost your liver's ability to destroy carcinogens, um, ingested carcinogens. So we really do... Um, and, and so these cruciferous vegetables actually have a double punch. They boost your liver's ability to deactivate carcinogens and are packed to the hilt with antioxidants in the first place. Um, and so really some of our healthiest vegetables. But also the deep yellow and orange um, vegetables as well, like pumpkins, sweet potatoes, yams, etc. Now you can contrast this with... America's favorite vegetable, the French fry. Um, and of course, America's second favorite vegetable, iceberg lettuce. You know, you can eat an entire head of iceberg lettuce and you get 10% of your RDA for nothing. There's nothing in it. You don't even get enough water in it. All right. You know, just as, as the USDA made a mistake, um, and telling people to eat grains, but not specifying whole grains. They made a mistake by just telling people to eat fruits and vegetables and not specifying the healthiest ones. And the healthiest ones are the ones with these vibrant colors because it's the plant pigments themselves we found that are these antioxidant um, compounds. We Americans eat a lot of beige food. So it's the ones with the brightest colors that we're looking for. But what do we eat? We eat white bread, white pasta, white potatoes, you know, um, white rice. And scientists are discovering more and more about the, the health benefits of these plant pigments that make fruits and vegetables such brilliant colors. So we've known about beta carotene, which when in fruits and vegetables actually has amazing uh, anti-cancer effects. This uh, study two years ago released by Harvard, lycopene, the, the red pigment that makes tomatoes red, watermelon red, pink grapefruits pink, um, actually um, is a powerful anti-cancer agent as well, found that those men eating 
um, just 10 servings of processed tomato product, pro products a week, like tomato sauce, tomato paste, 10 servings a week cut their risk of aggressive prostate cancer in half. And now we're finding the anthocyanin, the stuff that makes blueberries blue. It's a powerful anti-cancer agent as well. The anti-cancer, anti-aging, antioxidant properties of blueberries literally come out of the blue, really. So wait a second, why are dark green leafy vegetables the best? I mean, if all these colors are good, well, not so much here, but where I come from on the East Coast, we are blessed with the autumn where the leaves turn all these brilliant colors. Well, where were those colors in the summer? They were all there, but they were just hidden by the green pigment chlorophyll, and all that happens in the autumn is the green pigment dies away and all these other brilliant colors come out. So the beta carotene is there. All these other, you get the entire rainbow of phytonutrient effects all wrapped up into one when we eat our greens. That's why they truly are the healthiest things on the planet. Um, are really the best source of calcium as well. Eating just one serving of dark green leafies every day um, and you may have your risk of uh, bone fracture later, rate, later in life uh, based on the Harvard Nurses Study. Right? Half your risk of bone fracture just by eating greens or broccoli every day. Really amazing. And try to stick to whole grains. At least 25 nutrients are removed um, when whole, whole wheat flour is milled into white flour and then five are, are, are chemically replaced to so-called enrich it. Um, it's certainly the great grain robbery. That's just the vitamins and minerals. There's up to a 25,000% decrement in phytonutrient content, these wonderful antioxidant compounds. So, all right, Woo who can do five? Anybody? Millet? That's the first one you came up with? Where's millet? No? What do we, okay, what's here? Brown rice. Brown rice. Woo! All right. Uh, oh, let's do another. Uh, what, oh, you, you, okay, what about this? That's an easy one. Barley. Barley. Wonderful. Pearl barley. Okay. Okay. Oh, this is a good one. Oh. Wonderful way to get whole grains into the morning breakfast. Okay, now we get a little tougher. Buckwheat. Where's buckwheat? buckwheat. Indeed. Wonderful buckwheat. Wonderful grain. All right, what about this one? The smallest grain in the world... Teff, Ethiopian grain, wonderful. I mean, what you are looking here, you are looking at the basis of civilization, literally. And so this is many African civilizations were based on uh, millet um, and teff. We have uh, Asian civilizations, many based on rice. Um, uh, the Inca Empire was based on quinoa. Um, the Aztec Empire was based on uh, amaranth and so on and so forth. And you can buy these in bulk at Down to Earth. I haven't been to the other natural food store, but Down to Earth, they have this wonderful bulk section. And literally for a dollar a pound, you can get all these wonderful grains. So eat your whole grains, right? Fruits, vegetables, greens, and nuts and seeds. And if you do this, you will be getting mountains of nutrition, right? But are there any nutrients one has to worry about not getting enough of on a plant-based diet? Well, I mean, first of all, there's no nutrient, no vitamin, no mineral, no you know, protein that's only found in animal foods. But having said that, um, uh, because of the way most of us live in society now, there are two vitamins that vegans, those that, that, st that are, are, eat completely plant-based um, uh, diets, really need to pay particular attention to. And that is vitamin D and vitamin B12. And vitamin D, as Dr. Harris will tell you, is not really a vitamin at all, but a hormone that uh, the skin makes when you are exposed to sunlight. Well, wait a second, if it's the sunshine vitamin, can't we just walk outside and get enough every day? Yes, indeed, if you live in paradise in the islands here. But unfortunately, most Americans, at least, um, don't. Basically, below, um, uh, below L.A. and Atlanta, um, uh, you can get enough sunlight. But ab above that, in most of the northern latitude, Chicago, New York, you know, people know people living in these areas. During the summer months, the sun's rays are at such an angle that you're just not able to make enough vitamin D, particularly during the winter, to, um, to sustain yourselves. We really, about 90% of human evolution appear, was at the tropics, and we were just... 
We, we have just evolved to be baked in the sun. So uh, those living in northern climes um, really do need to get vitamin D in their diet. Now, cow's milk is fortified with vitamin D, but so are lots of other foods that have vitamin D added to them, like you know, breakfast cereals like raisin bran cereals, cornflakes. They all have vitamin D added to it. Um, many of the uh, many of the plant-based milks, soy milks, rice milks, nut milks, all have vitamin D added to them as well. There's even a uh, vitamin D uh, fortified orange juice now. So there's lots of ways to get vitamin D. But for here, um, people with lighter skin colors can get away with literally five to ten minutes of sunlight on their forearms and face just a few times a week in um, in uh, the islands here. Um, so you wouldn't have to worry about it at all. But if you live elsewhere, either of these fortified foods, you can get into multivitamin, something like that. Now, vitamin B12 also isn't made by plants, not made by animals either, made by these tiny bacteria, these little microbes that blanket the earth. And these bacteria can grow in the guts of some of the animals that people eat, and so some of the B12 actually gets into their flesh or milk and eggs as well. But, but for vegans, it's more difficult now. I mean, it used to be in the soil, it used to be in the water. I mean, we used to be able to get all the B12 we need drinking out of well water or mountain stream or something, but now we chlorinate our water supply to kill off any bacteria in our water. So we don't get a lot of B12 in our water anymore. We don't get a lot of cholera either. This is a good thing that we're doing this, but, but because of kind of the way we live in our modern world, um, vegetarians and vegans really should make sure they get a B12 um, source in their diet. So, but again, nothing that can't be you know, uh, solved with you know, a bowl of, uh, bowl of cornflakes or something. There's um, uh, a lot of fortif- B12 fortified foods, all the breakfast cereals. You can get it uh, you know, in a multivitamin, super cheap. It comes out to be like $5 a year if you want to get it in pill form. Um, but again, uh, there's you know, a lot of the fortified fake meats we talked about and the um, milks as well have B12 on it. But we really should make sure if we are going to choose to eat vegetarian that we look at some of the products we eat and we make sure that we get B12 in our diet every day. Now everyone, meat eaters and vegetarians alike, need to think more about getting more of the minerals, zinc, iron, and calcium into our diet. Now vegetarians and vegans are not at higher rates of mineral deficiencies, higher risk of mineral deficiencies than the rest of the population. But, you know, that's not saying much because everyone ha- really has crappy rates. And the solution really is these um, beans, greens, nuts, and seeds. Um, but if you're finding you're not getting a lot of color and variety in your diet, that's really the best way to get these uh, minerals. But um, then if, if not, you really should think about these fortified foods like you know, breakfast cereals, fortified soy milk, calcium, fortified orange juice, something like that. Now, that basically used to be the whole story, right? Get your vitamin D, get some sun, uh, uh, get, uh, make sure, think about your B12 and your minerals until omega-3s came along. There's a lot of research coming out now about the importance of omega-3 fatty acids in the diet. In a nutshell, walnuts are decent sources, certainly. Leafy greens, of course, have about everything. Now, non-vegetarians can get it from Nemo, but um, the most concentrated source in the, fa- in the world is actually not fish, but flax seeds. I recommend everyone, meat eaters and vegetarians alike, eat one to two tablespoons of ground flax seeds every day. Not only are they the world's most concentrated source of omega-3 fatty acids, also um, one of the best sources of soluble fiber, the best source on the planet of boron, which is important for bone health, uh, important source of these lignans, these anti-cancer fighting compounds. They are really a, a nutritional superstar. In fact, uh, Andrew Wild, Dr. Andrew Wild, the big alternative medicine guru, was asked, if, if people could just make one change in their diet, just do one thing, what should they do? And he replied, add flax seeds to your diet. All right. Uh, really, any way you cut it, flax is really the best way to get your omega 3s fatty acid, and in many ways, much better than getting it from fish, from these deep sea fish, to kind of spite you. Um, oh, and, and uh, flax seeds, there's a lot of uh, um, easy varieties that pre ground flax seeds. Um, which you can find as well, which is easy, to um, kind of spite you for filleting them. These fishies now load up your body with toxic heavy metals like mercury and lead. We have so kind of polluted our oceans, particularly with the coal industry. There's also worry about PCBs and DDT, particularly from uh, farmed raised fish now. In fact, worries about mental retardation and birth defects has led the FDA 
to recommend that pregnant women and small children not eat, limit their fish consumption dramatically. And fish is a disaster from a food safety point of view, can spread uh, anything from cholera, hepatitis, environmental disaster as well. So, you know, when a, when a fish-eating woman comes into my office, I just have to say, hold up my hand, say, just the flax, ma'am. <sighs> Sorry. All right, we talked about some of the healthiest vegetarian options, and I believe I already gave it away. What is the single unhealthiest food or food ingredient we could possibly put in our bodies? Hydrogenated fats, indeed. Um, And why are they so dangerous? There are these trans fats. Trans fats are basically only found one place in nature, and that's animal fats. Basically, all animal fats contain these toxic trans fats. All right, who can name the animals? Just kidding. No, um, uh, no uh, but th- now, thanks to better living through chemistry, the food industry found a way to create these um, trans fats by hydrogenating vegetable oil in a process called hydrogenation, which rearranges their atoms and, ma- and makes them act more like animal fats. Now, the National Academy of Sciences released a damning report on trans fats. In fact, just last week, New York City um, voted to ban all trans fats in restaurants, etc. Really, the first city in the country, and they are going to see a dramatic plummet in, um, in heart disease deaths just from what that single change. Uh, now, the National Academy of Sciences, the, uh, it's certainly at least the most prestigious um, scientific authority here in the United States, um, released a damning report on trans fats, and they concluded that the only safe intake of trans fats is zero. The only safe, the upper permitted daily limit of intake, zero grams a day. So it's important not only away, not only to stay away from animal products, but from all these kind of cake cookies, crackers, you know, uh, margarine, you know, potato chips shortening, etc. Um, that make up the trans fat consumption in the American diet. Right. Uh, so it's, it's, there's 40,000 <laughs> there's 40,000 products on our shelves. Basically, anything in a box or a bag, you should look for the words partially hydrogenated on the label. And in fact, 2006, um, thankfully, um, uh, as of 2006, the FDA has required labeling. So on all food products, you don't even have to look in the ingredients list. You can actually see it should say trans fats, and you shouldn't buy anything that doesn't say zero. Um, uh, you know, but a quick aside, what are you saying? If the National Academy of Science is saying the only safe intake is zero, and it's only found in animal foods and processed foods, is the National Academy of Science is telling everyone to eat vegan, right? I mean, doesn't that make sense? I mean, if you, have, if you can only eat zero, right? They were challenged on that. And, um, and one of the authors of the report of nutritional epidemiologist at the Harvard School of Public Health, um, one of the authors responded to that challenge, and he said, we can't tell people to stop eating all meat and all dairy products. He said, well... We could tell people to become vegetarians, he added. If we were truly basing this only on science, we would, but it is a bit extreme. <laughs> Wouldn't want scientists basing anything on science, would we? No. As an aside, of course, diet is not the only component of health. We need lots of water, fresh air, and laughter. You need to love yourself, your family, what you do for a living, seatbelts, bike helmets, safer sex, limit alcohol, quit smoking, etc., etc. Lots of exercise. Plenty of diet is not the only challenge, though, of moving towards a more plant-based diet. There's uh, social issues as well. You know, people can experience, you know, pressure from others, friends and family. Um, uh, So if you don't have a supportive environment at home, it can be kind of isolated, isolating in our meat-laden culture. One way you can combat this is become involved with the local vegetarian society, and indeed one of the biggest in the country you are so blessed to live on the islands here because there's such a vibrant after society, and I encourage people to get involved. There are also a bunch of kind of vegetarian chat rooms and online resources as well. Probably the most popular is VegSource and not just because they were plugging my book a while ago. Um, and, uh, but, and if you're looking for a good book, my favorite one on this topic, in terms of dealing with friends, family, the holidays, that sort of thing, is this wonderful book called Living Among Meat Eaters by, um, by Carol Adams. And finally, I just want to say something about kind of the self-pressure. 
I see some people kind of put themselves under. Some uh, vegans don't eat honey, for example, because because there's a certain number of bees somehow killed in the production of honey, right? But if you don't care about the bee, the lives of bees, eat all the honey you want. I mean, it's uh, you know uh, as long as you're not an infant, don't have blood sugar problems, right? I mean, a few vegans won't even eat sugar because some uh, some sugar is decolorized with degreased cattle bones, with so-called bone char, right? Um, uh, you know, well, is that? I mean. There's lots of good reasons to stay away from sugar, apply to the Haitian sugar, you know, sugar workers, etc., etc. But regardless, this should not c- kind of come in the way of people eating, you know, trying to reduce their consumption of animal products. This kind of more vegetarian than thou attitude I see in many kind of vegetarian circles is really counterproductive, um, uh, you know, condescending, really kind of self-defeating. Um, uh, as uh, Julia Butterfly Hill once said. Being vegan isn't about judgment, it's about joy. Right? You know, vegetarianism is not some, about some kind of personal purity or something. It's, it's, you know, it's not a religion. It's about reducing animal suffering or helping the environment or, you know, eating healthier. Right? It's about having some perspective. You know, people come to me and say things like, well, I could never be vegetarian because I could never give up shrimp or something. Well, then fine, then don't, right? I mean, imagine what you'd be doing for your health if you kind of gave up everything except shrimp. I could never give up my mom's chicken soup. Well, then don't. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, it's kind of a false dichotomy here, right? Um, adopting a vegetarian or partly vegetarian diet is, uh, you know, a highly personal decision. You should do what's right for you. Move at the pace that you are um, comfortable with. You know, no one's keeping score but you. Any steps we can make towards a plant-based diet, the healthier um, we will be. Thank you. Um, thank you for not all leaping to your feet immediately. Uh, we've gotten a lot of precise data from Dr. Greger today. He knows his stuff, and the details he's presented are marvelous. Uh, as usual, we have lots of food from down to earth, uh, brought to us today by Grant Tolley, who volunteered to bring it. <laughs> Nobody stepped forward to volunteer to serve it up, so our president has done that. And so it's all out there. And if your first plate doesn't have enough, please go back and fill it up. Go into the kitchen and ask to have it filled up again. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.